Hey, it's Brad Pitt. (laughs) I'm kidding. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Thank you, sir. It's America's top expert on infectious diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Gracias. Thank you. How's, how's el español? Very poor. I'm sorry. I wish it were better, but I, I'm not very good. <laughs> I got to teach you some words. Tengo que enseñar alguna, algunas palabras. Dr. Fauci, um, social distancing can be uh, challenging for some. Uh, Latino households tend to have more, more members living under one, uh, the same roof. Uh, what do you recommend for those in a situation uh, like this that, that want to keep as safe as possible? Yeah. Well, one of the issues, as you probably know very well, is particularly among the vulnerable people. And I know from my Latino friends that they're multi-generational, that you may have grandma or grandpa in the house with you, uh, is to try and best as possible to uh, protect the vulnerable. And I think when you're in a household, if you're fairly certain that everybody in the house is uninfected, which you can, you know, if you have the availability of testing, you have some suspicion, fine. But if you don't, wearing a mask when you cannot stay the six feet apart, but when you're in a household, that's almost impossible to do that. So to the extent that you can wear a mask, that would be appropriate. If you are in a household where it's, you've gone for an extended period of time without any necessary outside contact with people so you can feel fairly comfortable that your family unit is not infected, then you're okay. But when you go outside, that's where you get the protection. So when you go outside, wear a mask, stay six feet away, avoid crowds, wash your hands as frequently as you can, so that when the members of the household get together in the house, you can at least feel secure in your own home. It's protecting on the outside that you need to worry about. Are, are you satisfied with the rate in which states are, are reopening? You know, Florida had a single day high with 1,419 new cases last Thursday alone. Do you think that Florida opened too soon? You know, I don't want to pass any judgments on on. on locations, states, towns, cities, counties. But the only thing I could say is what I say continually and consistently, that to the extent possible, locations, which are different from one to another, uh, must do the opening in accordance with the level of infection in your particular location. So one size does not fit all. If you are in an area where there's very few infections, and there are so many different counties throughout the the, the country, I didn't realize it until I looked it up, there are 3,007 counties in the United States. And there are counties that are near big infection outbreaks, and there are counties where there are very few infections. When you're opening up, you've got to do it according to the guidelines that match your location. So if you have a, a, a situation where the guidelines say, be careful, go slowly, you really should. Once you start leapfrogging over the benchmarks of concern, the gateway, the phase one and the phase two, you obviously increase the risk that you will have an acceleration of infection. And that's one thing that I do worry about. So although I understand, I very well understand the need to return to some form of normal, the need to get the economy going, You've got to be careful that you do that in a prudent way that doesn't rush it to the point where you actually increase greatly the risk of there being a resurgence of infection. Um, Some are still in disbelief, I'd say. Some people think that COVID-19 is a conspiracy, right? Uh, Maybe since they don't personally know someone that has been affected, actually affected. What would you tell these folks? Well, I I would, I mean... I would not criticize them because that would only turn them off. I would say when you're dealing with something as serious as a health issue that has already killed 110,000 people in the United States, that is now spread throughout the world, that look at the data and the information and make up your mind based on real facts. And although you may not know someone 
who has been infected and who has gotten sick or has died. There are plenty of people out there. I mean, look at what happened in New York City. It was very unfortunate. They got hit very, very badly. And they, at one period of time, had more than half of the infections and deaths were in New York City. That's changed now because they're doing much better. So this is not a hoax. I think all you're doing by thinking it's a hoax is fooling yourself, putting yourself in danger. But as important, you may be inadvertently putting your loved ones in danger because if you think it's okay for you to get infected, maybe because you're young and you're very healthy and the likelihood of you getting a serious consequence is low. If you infect someone, a relative or a friend or a loved one who has an underlying condition, you could be responsible for their getting into a lot of trouble and even dying. You know, and I, and I have to ask you because so many of my listeners uh, bring this up on the radio program. Does radiation from 5G towers weaken your immune system and make you more susceptible to, to the virus? No, there's, there's no evidence at all. That's folklore. That's not a scientific fact. Some of these conspiracies might seem funny might seem like, like, like a joke, but some have made you personally out to be uh, a villain, like the bad guy in this whole thing. As a, ma as a matter of fact, I know you've been attacked on social media. You've received uh, threats. Is this new for you? Uh, have you ever previously been in a situation where it was politics versus public health? Uh, I have been, but it has never been as intense and as deep-seated as now. During the very early years of the HIV outbreak, where I was devoting my entire professional life to fighting HIV, there were uh, some sort of hate mail threats of homophobic people, you know, who were telling me that I was, you know, uh, involved in spreading false information because. I was kind of linked up with the gay community, which I certainly mm -hmm. was and am <laughs> as, as a public health official. And as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, I thank you for that, sir. Yeah. And the, then when we were doing Ebola in Africa uh, and we were putting resources there, there were some people who were threatening me and making uh, inferences that I cared more about black Africans and I cared about Americans, which is crazy. I care about all people equally. Um, but what's going on now is a different, it's a different level. I um, mean, the, the amount of, of threats on my own life, uh, on harassing my family, my children, and my wife is, is, is well, well, well beyond anything that I've ever experienced before. It's really unfortunate, the divisiveness that we see in our society now where people put political implications on things that should have nothing to do with politics. It's all about public health and the safety of the American people and the safety of the entire world. So it's very disappointing when you get those kinds of uh, dark web type threats. How difficult is it to be uh, tossed up into that situation without wanting to be in a press conference, having to bite your tongue uh, knowing what you know that you that what your job is based on science and really trying to save lives and and not trying to get into a situation where you're adding more fuel to the fire politically speaking yeah i mean that that's difficult you've got to continue to focus like a laser beam on what the job that you're supposed to be doing and that is to protect the public health to do the science and the discovery that gets us drugs, that gets us to better understand the infection, that gets us to develop a vaccine, to make the proper public health recommendations to dampen the spread of infection. When you focus on what your job is, you've got to screen out all of those other pressures that get in the way of telling things the way they are. What's well, been admirable to, to watch you in this process and painful. Uh, we feel for you. I feel for you. Uh, you know, you've recommended never shaking hands again to protect against not only COVID, but against the flu as well. Uh, but Latinos are very warm people. 
uh, we hug and we kiss. And sometimes we, we kiss on both cheeks and ambos cachetes. It's part of our, our culture. Uh, are hugs and, and kisses canceled forever? No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm a kind of a hugging guy too, being an Italian American background. It's a, not, not quite as huggy as you guys, but close. <laughs> so, um, no, I don't. Just for I, now. I, I think that that would be an exaggeration to say that. I think while we're having active infection as part of the broad approach toward avoiding as much as possible physical contact, I think shaking hands and hugging should be put in suspension for a while. Okay. If we get a vaccine for uh, this terrible disease and get it and delegate it to history, relegate it to history as opposed mm -hmm. to the threat that it is, I think we could have some degree of normality, including the wonderful custom that you have of hugging your loved ones and your friends. Talking about the vaccine, how far away are we from actually having a vaccine? I think we're making extraordinary progress in a very, very uh, abbreviated time frame. Abbreviated not by sacrificing any element of safety and certainly not by sacrificing any element of scientific integrity. But we've been able to move quickly by the advances in technology that we have that enable us to move very quickly from the time we first recognized this virus to the time we went into a clinical trial, which was the fastest on record, it really was. The virus, the sequence of the virus was published on Jan January 10th. I called a meeting of my staff on the 11th. We started working on a vaccine on the 14th of January. 62 days later, we had the first dose into a human for a safety trial. We're gonna start advanced trials for efficacy in the beginning of July. And hopefully as we get to the end of the fall and early winter, we will know whether a vaccine works. There's a lot of ifs about vaccine development. It's very risky. There's no guarantee that you're gonna get a effective vaccine. But we have an aspirational hope that we will get there by the end of this year so that we might have vaccine available to people by the end of this year, December or so, and January, February, March of next year. It's not a promise, it's a hope, but I'm cautiously optimistic about it. Because this has moved so, so fast, how comfortable do you think people will feel actually getting the vaccine once it is available? Yeah, I think that's important. That's why I said this, is, this type of uh, quickness in doing it mm -hmm. is by no means sacrificing the safety elements of making sure we're dealing with a vaccine that's safe. The way you get people to accept the vaccine is that you do good community outreach. You're very transparent. You answer the questions that the community has and you reach out to the community as opposed to expecting them to believe you in everything you say. You've got to reach out to them. You think it's going to make a difference whether it's going to be a a Chinese vaccine, if they develop that first, or if it's an American vaccine? Well, I, I think that the vaccines are going to probably come out at about the same time. The Chinese are no further ahead of us than we are. There are so many different candidates. We're involved directly or indirectly with four or five of these candidates. I believe even more than one will likely get to the finish line. This is not going to be a race where there's only one winner. I believe that there are possibilities and I feel that it's likely that you'll see more than one candidate prove itself to be both safe and effective. With that said, we know that the president has canceled our, our help to the World Health uh, Organization. As Americans, how concerned should we be about that? How concerned are you about that? Well, I've been dealing with the World Health Organization ever since I got involved in public health and medicine, you know, from the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. I've developed a lot of friends in the public health uh, community who work at WHO. I know personally the Director General of WHO, who's a very competent person, Dr. Tedros. So I, I will continue my interactions with them despite anything else that's going on. Um, the death of George Floyd, uh, of course, we all know has uh, in police custody in, Minis in Minneapolis has sparked protests around the world, as we all know. W what do you tell uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters? Uh, how can they protect themselves? How can they effectively exercise their rights, specifically here in the United States, our, our, you know, our constitutional rights, 
and, and voice their concerns, but still uh, be safe? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I am very aware of and, sympath and, and, and sympathetic with the need and, and, and in many respects, the compelling uh, reason to demonstrate peacefully for a cause that you feel is, is as important as this. And it is a very, very important cause. Uh, in a perfect world, you'd say, because of the crowdedness that occurs when you demonstrate and the risk of infection, that you shouldn't do that. But I think the reality of the situation is, whether I say do it or not, it's gonna get done. So if you're going to do it, to the best of your knowledge, protect yourself as best you can. Wear a mask at all times. Try and keep as far away from others as possible, which becomes extremely difficult in a demonstration because you're in a crowd. But one thing you can do, because when you look at the film clips of it, when people get animated and they start shouting and chanting, they generally pull their mask down. Avoid doing that. If you're going to be there, leave the mask on at all times because that would clearly diminish the likelihood that you'll be spreading an infection. And talking about masks, there's been so much back and forth. Um, knowing what we know today, who should be wearing a mask? A anyone that can tolerate a mask should be wearing a mask. Okay. I mean, it really should be almost universal. When I'm outside, I live in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. When I'm outside, in the public, even though I try and succeed in keeping a six foot distance, I always have a mask on. Only now when there's nobody in the room but me, <laughs> am I without a mask. But when I'm in a situation where I actually have the possibility of contact within six feet of someone, I wear a mask. And I think that should be a general rule until the infection is so low that people don't need to wear masks anymore. And hopefully that'll be very soon. Do you recommend vitamins or supplements to, to boost uh, your immune system? You know, vitamins are important if you're vitamin deficient. And some people are. I mean, particularly vitamins like vitamin D, when you don't get enough sunlight, uh, you should supplement with that. Uh, vitamin C is a good antioxidant. Uh, there's nothing wrong with taking uh, vitamins. If you have normal levels of vitamins, it's unlikely that that's gonna boost your immune system that much, even though there's a lot of advertisements that say it will, the data that indicate that that. Uh, but supplemental vitamin is good because you never know when you're actually uh, uh, deficient in a vitamin, particularly important ones like vitamin D. You mentioned a couple of days ago that it had been weeks since you last spoke to the president or that the president has spoken to you. Has that changed? Yeah, I spoke to him a few days ago. Yeah, I did, last week. So today's, uh, Monday, I spoke to him last uh, Tuesday and Thursday, both. Yeah. Right. In closing, Dr. Fauci, your message to all Americans that are concerned and want to keep safe. Yeah. My concern is hang in there. This will end. This is not going to be forever. I know it's exhausting sometime to abide by the conditions that we're under now to avoid further infections, but it is working the mitigation and the physical distancing that we're doing has prevented us from having many, many, many more infections than we already have. I know it's tough, but hang in there. It will be over. This will end and we will get back to normal. Dr. Fauci, thank you for your tireless uh, work in educating and supporting uh, all Americans and for keeping us uh, informed. We know it has not been very easy for you. Uh, but most importantly, thank you for, for keeping us healthy. Muchas gracias, Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.